I'm Martha. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Uber in San Francisco. And I primarily work in JavaScript. I also work uh, with Python. Um, and I really like cats, as was said. Uh, I also like bourbon. And I really like talking with people on Twitter. So you should uh, follow me. Uh, so also, uh, disclaimer, uh, I really hope this presentation is coherent. I'm quite jet lagged. So we'll see what happens. Uh, so um, does anyone know what software's primary technical imperative is? Is this something that you've heard of? Um, sure. Uh, my, this actually proves my point, uh, managing complexity. Uh, that's truly like our only job as software engineers is to manage complexity. So you don't have to think about too many things at any given time. I just wanted to put this up here to remind myself mostly and just maybe like kind of spread that amongst the developer consciousness. Um, uh, I actually found that from a book called Code Complete written by Steve McConnell. I highly recommend it. Um, so uh, the only way to truly manage complexity is to understand it. And that's why I personally like to kind of dig into like the ECMA specifications and figure out what's happening underneath. Um, I really like to kind of think about the gritty details of JavaScript. So hopefully uh, you learn something. Uh, so uh, JavaScript is usually interpreted, uh, not always. Uh, but what that means is that your source code, which is the JavaScript code you're writing, is parsed, which is then turned into an abstract syntax tree, which is then generated into bytecode, which is then interpreted into machine code. And uh, machine code are just the zeros and ones that are the actual instructions to your machine. Um, so uh, when I said uh, that it's usually interpreted, uh, one use case where it's not is in V8. It's actually uh, just converted directly to machine code and not interpreted. Uh, so uh, JavaScript is really wonderful, which is probably why most of us are here. Uh, nearly everything is an object, uh, which is kind of really freeing to think about. Uh, and functions are first class objects, which means you can store them in variables. You can assign them as methods to an object. You can store them in an array. Uh, you can be, pass them as arguments to other functions, and you can return them from other functions. Uh, so really, the only special property about a function um, is that it can be invoked. Uh, so one of, the, one of the, the more complex parts of JavaScript is because function objects are first class, uh, they, and they can be passed around quite frequently, uh, many things are decided at runtime. Uh, so these are things like scope or the value of the keyword this. Uh, and those uh, concepts are a little confusing uh, at first, like especially if you come from another language. So uh, I love this quote. Uh, I also I hope everyone is either considering reading or has read JavaScript, the good parts. But the best thing about JavaScript is this implementation of functions that got almost everything right. But as you can expect with JavaScript, it didn't get everything right. Um, anyways, I just like to keep that in the back of my mind. Uh, so uh, I kind of tricked you with the title of my talk. I'm not really here to talk about the interpreter. I'm really here just to talk about how your code is processed. Uh, so sorry that I, I tricked you there. Um, but I really want to spend time talking about how function objects are created, and then subsequently how, what happens when they're executed. Um, so when a function object is actually created, several things happen behind the scenes. Uh, I've you know, listed several things here. Um, and uh, basically, all of these steps that happen during creation, they're kind of encapsulated in this concept called an execution cont context. And an execution context is just a word um, that you, is used to kind of encapsulate the environment that a certain piece of code uh, that encompasses a piece of code when it was run. So, uh, and uh, fortunately for us, or maybe unfortunately, I'm not sure, but everything in JavaScript is dependent upon an execution context. Uh, and uh, the, the good news is there are only three possible execution contexts that code can be evaluated in. The first is global, the second is function context, and the third is eval. And so even luckier, I'm not really going to talk about eval because it's kind of not super relevant. So we'll just focus on uh, global execution context and function execution context. Um, so when you run a script in the browser, um, it first enters the global execution context. Uh, it will remain there until it finds a function, and then it will subsequently enter a function execution context. So really, most of the time, uh, we're dealing with function execution context and not necessarily uh, global. Um, there is always one global execution context. Uh, there can be infinite number of function contexts. Um, so the tricky bit is, if you aren't operating inside of a function, chances are you're in the global context. And that's kind of why everything is implicitly global within JavaScript, which is kind of one of the more tricky parts. <laughs> 
so um, execution contexts are, um, you can kind of like conceptualize them uh, as operating within a stack. So the first, when it first enters or starts parsing and executing your script, it will enter the global execution uh, context. And then once it finds a function, it will then, uh, the, that function's ex execution context will be pushed to the top of the stack. It will operate. If it calls a function, it will keep happening. Uh, and especially like if a, a function calls itself recursively, that'll still continue to happen. It will continue to enter a new function execution context every time it's evaluated. Um, but then once it's finished uh, evaluating or executing, it will release control back to the execution context that called it and be popped from the stack. Uh, so uh, this is uh, how I like to visually conceptualize an execution context. It's, it's not an actual object. It's just something behind the scenes. Um, but I like to think of it as an object that contains other objects. Uh, and uh, the three things that we're really concerned with that happen are uh, this activation object inside of the execution contest, context, um, the value of the scope chain, so what's in scope for this particular function, and then the value of this. Uh, so here's the tricky part. I hope I get this right. This is insanely complicated. So what happens inside of an execution context when it is created? Um, the first thing that happens is an activation object is created. Uh, and an activation object um, is, uh, I mean, I like to think of it like an object, but the first thing that happens is a property is appended to it uh, called arguments, and it's just a list of all of the arguments applied to the function. Uh, and then the second thing that happens, oh, and I should note that this happens in order uh, when, when the context is actually created. Um, so the second thing that happens is scope is defined, um, and this is hard for me to articulate. So scope, um, it's basically a chain of objects or, or object-like things that are available to this function, uh, or everything that's uh, yeah, in scope and available to this function. So all the identifiers that it can resolve um, are included in scope. Um, anyways, I will get back to that later. I have another slide that discusses that in more detail. Um, but the third thing that happens is variable instantiation. And this is where things can get a little bit tricky. So uh, first, um, well, actually, one thing that happens is so there's this activation object that I mentioned that's created first. Um, and, then, and then scope is defined. So at this point, when variable instantiation happens, the activation object kind of magically is turned into something called a variable object. Uh, and, and basically what happens are the parameters that are uh, defined inside the function are uh, added as properties to this object. The values are signed as uh, the resulting arguments that are passed to the function. And it's uh, oh, yeah, and then uh, the second thing that happens are function declarations. Uh, so if there's a named function, the name is appended into this variable object, and the value is a pointer to the function object itself. Um, so yeah, the name is the property, and the function, pointer to the function object is the value. And so the third thing that happens are variable names are appended to this object, and uh, the important thing to remember here is the variable values assigned to the property name are undefined. Um, and also another like weird thing to think about. Um, so when the variable instantiation, or when inv variable instantiation is happening, uh, so first, like I said, parameters are defined and their values are the arguments. The second thing, function names are supplied as properties and their values are a pointer to the function object. Um, variable names. So if there happens to be a variable name that shares the same identifier as a function, um, it will be overwritten. Uh, or no, pardon me, it won't be overwritten. It'll just be ignored. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, and also, uh, one other thing to keep in mind is the variable names are, are put into this variable object, but the values are undefined. Um, so if you ever see hoisting, that's mostly what that's about. Uh, so if you're uh, trying to reference a variable before it's actually been executed, or like assigned with the equal sign, like uh, in the code, um, it, it'll be undefined until that point. Uh, and so the last thing that happens is the value of this is defined. And uh, let's see, this is tricky, but it, I tried to uh, uh, like I tried to make it as simple as I possibly could. This holds a reference to the object that the function is being applied to at runtime, which is tricky because functions can be passed around. So, um, anyways, that's that's how I try to like simplify that in my mind whenever I'm debugging or going through code. Okay, so I promised I would talk more about scope. Um, so basically, scope is this context variable object. 
at the, the forefront. So um, when, if you're trying to like resolve an identifier like the name of like a property or a variable, it's going to check this function's variable object first. But also, at when this execution context is created, it stores a reference to its parent's variable object, which would in turn can, uh, contain a reference to its parent's variable object all the way up until the global, uh, until you reach the, the global execution context, or the, the global variable object. Um, so that's, that's what lexical scoping is all about, and that's why scoping can only happen within a function, because it's actually, scope is only defined within a function execution context. Um, and one interesting thing to note about variable instantiation um, when your script is first run and you're still in the uh, global execution context, all the top level variables and functions go through the same process. So they actually become members of the, globals, the, the global object's variable object. So I know that's like super crazy, but if you have a top-level function, that's why the value of this applies to the window, because it, at that point, like after it's been processed, that function itself is now a member of the global object. Uh, and yeah, and the, another way to like think about the value is this: is it points to the object at which the function is applied. So I know that's super tricky. Um, okay, so that's creation. It's kind of crazy, um, and I hope I explained it in a coherent way. We'll see. That remains to be seen. But uh, after that, activation. So basically, uh, after a function has been created, it runs, uh, and the, the code execution stage begins. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to take a moment to talk uh, very briefly about closures, uh, because I, I have a feeling that uh, or I know I personally, until I really learned about the variable object and scoping and like what that truly means, I had no idea really what closures were about. Uh, and so I have a kind of complicated definition up here, um, but I'm, I'm going to simplify it. But basically, a closure is formed when an inner function is made accessible outside of the function from which it was contained. So imagine if you had an inner function, but the outer function returned that inner function. Um, so basically what's happening there uh, is the inner function contains a reference to its parent's variable object. And when you actually return it, you make that available uh, uh, it, for when the inner function is executed outside of, uh, of its normal context, it, you effectively close over that variable object and make it available. Um, and so that's what that's all about. And I truly did not think I would blow through that so quickly, but I did. Um, I'm really happy to answer questions, if anyone has any. Okay, no? Okay, cool. So, yeah, are there any questions? A any questions yeah. out there? I can bring you a mic. And you can just find me, either on the internet or in real life, so you can talk to me about this. Oh, we do. Uh, we have a question. Um, so when you talked about the, um, the, I forget whether it was the context object or something, where you have the activation record and all that stuff, huh? um, are there any interpreters where this object is actually exposed? No, uh, it's just like an implementation construct, so it's just something that happens behind the scenes. And it's not an actual object, like I just think about it that way. Like it doesn't have a prototype or anything like that. Um, it's just like basically, it, it like assigns all of the values to all the things that you, you have access to within that function, within the context of whatever's running um, in memory. It makes me wonder after seeing Dominic's talk earlier whether we need to convince uh, some of the VM implementers that they should actually expose these kind of things. Because you can do this, I mean, Smalltalk mm -hmm. did this, and, and other languages do this, and you can do some really fun stuff. That sounds super fun. It sounds like you're adding complexity, so it makes me nervous. You but can, you it can would fake be fun. it with eval and iframes. Oh, yeah. A couple of people wanted to like, kill me when I said that. Do we have any uh, other questions? Yeah, eval oh. isn't inherently bad, it's just inherently dangerous, right? But I, I just prefer not to talk about it. Hey, Martha, Hi. can you spend the word on uh, block scopes? Oh, yeah. So um, one of the tricky things about JavaScript is it looks a lot like C. Like, it, it kind of borrowed a lot of the same syntax. So in C, everything is scoped, uh, is scoped by block. So like an if statement or something, like the, the scope would be contained within that block. Um, but uh, unfortunately slash fortunately for us within um, JavaScript, um, scope is not defined within like an if statement. It's only defined within a function. So um, that's why if you try and like reference a variable inside like a for loop or something, um, it's not actually scoped within the loop. It's scoped within the function that contains the loop. Does that help at all? Maybe. But yeah, there's no block scoping, only function scoping. Or it's global. Those are your two options. More questions? questions.
OK. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I know we have so much time. I, I have no idea how I rambled so quickly. Uh, so is it ever possible to point to like the parent scope? Is there, it it kind of sounded like it because you mentioned there's always a, a, a references up. Ah, yeah, that actually happens for you implicitly. You always have a reference to, like in, in, the, in the scope property, like right. in the execution context, it, it always has a pointer to the parent's scope. That's why like globals are implicit because it will eventually, like you, the scope will eventually resolve all the way up to the global level. So right, so you can always like access named properties of like the parent scope, but you can never mm -hmm. reference it directly, right? Like, parent this. Only if you return it, uh, you return a, a reference to that, to like what the context inside the function outside, like a closure. Like that'd be the only way that you could do that. Or window or global in Node. No. Don't do that though. No. <laughs> uh, uh, no. <laughs> Uh, can you talk about just kind of, I guess, how you got uh, started with reading more into the like actual implementation of yeah. um, like how you learned all this stuff? Yeah, yeah. So actually, a uh, fun fact. I'm glad we get to talk about this. This is much better than whatever I just did. Um, I ha I'm, have an art degree. Uh, I totally self-taught. I went to hacker school. Highly recommend it. Wonderful program. Um, but for some reason, like even like through my like school, like through high school, all of that, like I kind of have to completely immerse myself with something, and I don't feel like I feel comfortable going forward until I know every small detail about every little thing. So I just like Googled a lot and interneted a lot and all of that, but reading the actual like ECMAS specifications are amazing. Um, so yeah, it's just curiosity. Um, or sometimes like I'm really guilty whenever I'm coding of just like banging my head and my hands and my heart against the keyboard and then not really understanding what's happening. And so I think reading and researching kind of gives me a chance to step back and actually understand what's happening. Um, but yeah, I read specifications. It's pretty awesome. Verbose, a little weird. Maybe, maybe that would be a chance for me to write some blog posts that are maybe a little simplified. But yeah. This question from Brian What is Hacker School? Oh, Hacker School is a three month program in New York City. Uh, and they call it a writer's retreat for hackers or programmers. Um, they do prefer that you have some experience before you go. Um, I shouldn't admit this publicly, but I lied on my application. And somehow I, I still made it through the technical interview anyways. So, um, but they're wonderful. Um, they, yeah, it's just basically three months for you to do whatever you want. And they, they give you a lot of resources um, to mentors, and they focus on open source. And it's a really like, non-judgmental atmosphere. You can ask any question. And I really appreciated that about it. I really need to book a car somewhere. Could you help with that? I can. I can in Berlin. Yes, use Uber. Any more questions? Um, I just wanted to mention to the earlier question about whether you can, whether there's any way of actually um, inspecting sort of like the, the scope chain. Um, if anyone saw my talk earlier, you can, you can actually use something like Esprima to um, rewrite your JavaScript so that you actually have an object which knows which scope a function was identified in. Sweet. Um, so you can do some pretty fun stuff with that. That's awesome. Nice callback to an earlier talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am actually here all day. <laughs> OK. Anyone yeah, else? I know. We're exhausting cool. all of the topics. Well, but it is lunch time. So we're using the amazing innovative radial system for lunch. But I don't know what that means. So. Innovate. Okay, thank you. <laughs>